Well, welcome everybody to our weekly seminar series at the Department of Marine Geosciences. We're very happy that everybody came by the strikes that we're having. Um, and today we are hosting from England, the UK. I really feel that we are in the Eurovision Song Contest. Each week is a different European country. So today we're hosting Dr. Dana Titelboim from Oxford in the UK. A uh, short uh, information about Dana. She's, uh, she received a PhD from the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences at Ben Gurion University of the Negev under the supervision of Professor Sigala Bermovic with uh, co-supervisions of uh, Balak Herut, who we know from IOLR, and Auba Almogi al Labin from a uh, geological survey of Israel. During the PhD, she investigated the effect of future warming on benthic foraminifera and their use as environmental proxies for anthropogenic pollution. Following the PhD, Dana was award, awarded with uh, a Royal Society Con Fellowship at the University of Bristol, which she <coughs> simultaneously held alongside a Rothschild Fellowship. During this period, she studied the effect of climate change on calcification processes, specifically de 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 developing into effects on the quantity quantification and quali qualitative, qualitative and quantification of carbonate production in shallow uh, ecosystems. Currently, she is a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Oxford. Her present research is dedicated to unraveling the effect of climate change on the adaptation processes of coccolithic force and the subsequent impl implications for the carbon cycle. So today she is going to talk about the effect of future warming on classifying organisms, some like it hot. Thank you, Dana, for the, being here with us, even virtually, and the podium is yours. Okay, so thank you uh, for having me. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. And today I am very excited to tell you about my research that deals with the predicted effect of future warming on calcifying organisms. And climate changes are projected to impact all marine environments in many ways. But in the case of calcifying organisms, the predicted changes will specifically influence their ability to perform some of the main functions that this group has, which are which includes regulating the marine carbon cycle through carbonate production and photosynthesis, as well as uh, forming habitats that are uh, some of the most uh, rich biodiversity hotspots in the world. And unfortunately, climate changes are threatening these amazing ecosystems and the services that they provide to the environment and to, and to us as a society. So in my research, I mostly focus on two groups of calcifying organisms, benthic foraminifera from the shallow shelf environments and coccolithoform from the more open sea environment. And I'll just say a few words about each of these groups so everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about moving forwards. So benthic foraminifera are single-celled eukaryotes found globally and abundantly in the oceans. They have key roles in cementation of reef structures, and they are also a major source of sand, which help maintain shorelines, and in many case, cases actually a, a help persist the persistence of island as sea level continue to rise. Some of the benthic foraminifera species harbor symbiont algae, similar to what we know from corals, but maybe the coolest thing about them is that different species have very different thermal tolerances, included species that can actually calcify even at 40 degrees. So all of this combined, I think, makes them a very good system to try and understand what confers thermal tolerance in calcifying organisms in general, and specifically in symbiont bearing calcifiers. Now, the second group that I'm working on are coccolithophores. These are phytoplankton algae that are both major calcifiers and photosynthesizers. They are globally abundant in very high numbers, and so they have a significant role in regulating the marine carbon cycles. And I will expand on that a little bit later when I touch on that side of my research. So today's talk is really uh, following my scientific journey over the past 10, 10 years or so, um, and starting with my master's and PhD that I did in Ben Gurion University. There's a feedback. Is that... Is that okay? Yep. Okay, sorry, I don't know what happened. 
So during my, my master's and PhD, I combined laboratory and field experiments to examine species-specific responses of benthic foraminifera species to heat stress. I then wanted to examine what controls these species-specific thermal tolerances, and specifically, what is the role of symbiont algae in thermal tolerance. I will then tell you a little bit about what I did in my Royal Society Fellowship in the University of Bristol, where I tried to quantify how warming will affect carbonate production. And then I will tell you about my current work as a Marie Curie Fellow in the University of Oxford um, that I'm doing now. And I'm currently trying to understand uh, the adaptation potential of coccolithophores to warming and what implication this might have for the carbon cycle. And at the end of all of this, if I still have time, I will try to kind of show you how this all comes together and, and where I think this is all going. But just to be really clear, this is quite a lot to go through. So I'm just going to show like the highlights uh, or like the main outcomes of each of these projects. Uh, but I'm more than happy to take questions or to continue the discussion afterwards about any, any part of, of any of this. Okay, so our story begins at the coast of Hadera where an electrical power plant pumps water year round to cool the turbines and then discharge the warm water back into the sea, creating a thermal anomaly of about one and a half kilometer along the coast, basically mimicking future warming under natural conditions. And this provides a great opportunity for us to use this location as a field laboratory eh, to try and understand the effects of future warming on ecosystems without making all the assumptions and all the limitations that we have in the lab. So here you can see an illustration of the disturbed area with the two study sites that I have used in my research um, uh, that I've monitored. The first is marked in red at the core of the plume where temperature are the highest. And the second station right here is marked in green. <clears throat> it's at the edge of the plume where temperature are only slightly elevated compared to normal conditions in the Eastern Mediterranean today. And we've also monitored a control station at the coast of Nakhcholim so this is about 18 kilometers north to the power station. So it is not affected by the warm water discharge. And basically what I did is that I've monitored the environmental condition and the foraminiferal populations in these three locations for a duration of about 15 months. And specifically uh, the temperature were monitored in very high resolution every 15 minutes with temperature loggers. And you can see this monitoring here in this graph and you can basically see that at the core of the plume, marked in red, temperature are much higher than the control station, marked in blue. We we're talking about an annual average of about five degrees increase and a maximum of about 10 degrees increase. And if you compare that to the green uh, measurements from the edge of the plume, you can see there is still a difference, but it's much, much smaller. And we're talking about an annual average of about one and a half degrees and not more than three degrees in maximum difference between the control and the edge of the plume. Now, monitoring the foraminiferal population showed that the local species of the Eastern Mediterranean can be divided into three groups according to their presence or absence from each of the stations, which basically reflects their thermal tolerance. So this essentially indicated which species will be the winners and losers of future warming. Now, the first group marked in blue are species that occupy the control station, but do not inhibit even the edge of the heat plume. Now, remember, this is only one and a half degrees higher than the control. So this basically shows that, that these species live so close to their thermal thresholds that in the very near future, they will have to migrate away. They could no, no longer exist uh, in our coasts. The second group are species that are common in both the control and the edge of the plume, but not at the core of it. So they can survive a small increase in temperature, but not much more than that. And then we have a group of four species that uh, are actually occupy all of the stations, including the, the core part of the heat plumes, showing their high resilience and obviously that they will be the winners of future warming as they will probably be the only species that could actually still uh, occupy our environments. So the main implication of these results uh, is that the negative effect of warming in the Eastern Mediterranean will occur in two stages. The first with only a very small increase of just about one and a half degrees, which is, I, I think is terrifying really. So let's start by focusing uh, on the most resilient species. And the reason that I start with the most resilient species is it's really these are the, the most relevant ones because these are the ones that will actually be able to survive as we continue and heat the, the world and the oceans. And in these graphs here, you can see the numerical abundance in the red bars and the monthly average temperature in the black uh, diamonds. And you can see that out of the four species, only two 
actually present, uh, actually present consistently throughout the year, even in the extreme months. So this shows us that these are the two most resilient species. Uh, but also interestingly, you can see that Pararotalia, the species that you see here, actually reduces their abundances between June and July when temperature is about 34 degrees. And this is unlike all the other species that actually reduces their abundances between April and May, much earlier, when temperature is only 30 degrees. So this was our first indication that Pararotalia might actually be a very resilient species, much more than all the local species and even those that are resilient enough to live within the heat plume. So the next question that I wanted to ask was, okay, so do these tolerant species, do they just survive in the plume or do they actually, or do they actually do well? Do they, can they actually continue to calcify and do all of what they're normally doing? And to understand that, I used shells um, of the most resilient species collected throughout the year from the warm and control station. And I used magnesium reconnaissance thermometry to determine the calcification temperature of their last chamber. So I'll just very briefly explain how this works. Basically, as temperature increases, uh, there is more magnesium that incorporates into the calcite lattice. So magnesium content increases. And I produced laboratory-based calibration of magnesium calcium to temperature for each of the species, and then analyzed the last chamber that I collected from the field, from the warm and control station, to see the actual temperature that they calcified in. And this is basically what you see here. So on the right, Parotalia, the very resilient species. On the left, Lachlanella, the, the apparently second most resilient species. Upper panel is the control station, and lower panel is the warm station. The black diamonds are the measurement of magnesium calcium converted into temperature. And the gray area that you see is the actual temperature as it was measured by our temperature loggers. So this is basically a comparison of the actual temperature that the foraminifera see versus the actual temperature that they calcify in. And every, uh, when they don't overlap, this shows us that there is a, a, some sort of difference or some sort of threshold for their calcification. And I'm not gonna go into all of the details here, but I just want you to notice that both of the species in the warm station. Oh, I don't see my arrow. Well, in the bottom pattern in the warm in the warm station, you can see that both species actually calcify at the highest temperature that they experience in the heat plume. So we do not see a higher threshold for calcification. While for both of the species in the control station, we see that they don't calcify at the lower temperature. So Lachlanella only calcifies above 15 degrees, and Parotalia only above 22 degrees. Um, which is quite amazing if you think about it, because what this means is that as temperature continues to increase, as warming continues, these two species will actually be better adapted to calcify throughout most of the year. And it's not only that they're going to survive, they're actually going to be able to calcify and contribute more carbonate as time progresses. Okay, so these were uh, the highlights of the most resilient species, but now I want to talk about another uh, very important foraminifera, which is called Amphistigina lobifera. It's the species that you see here. Um, as you can see, it's tolerant enough to live at the edge of the plume, so tolerates some increase in temperature, but definitely not a lot of it, as it does not appear at the uh, core warm part of the uh, disturbed area. And the reason that I focus on this species is it's because it's one of the most abundant foraminifera species, both globally and locally. In fact, uh, in the Israeli Mediterranean coast, this species sometimes presents more than 90% of the foraminiferal population. And not only uh, does this species is super abundant, it is actually a very successful invader that have made its way from the Red Sea through the Suez Canal to the Mediterranean is what we call the Lesepsian uh, invasion. And what is really interesting is that in the origin uh, locations, it has a sibling species, so a different species from the same genus, and they're both extremely common in the shallow water habitat. However, surprisingly, in the Eastern Mediterranean, we only find one species, this Amphistigina lobifera. And you don't have to be a Formina expert to see how these two species are very similar. They're obviously closely related, but for some reason, one of them did an amazing job invading and establishing a population when the other is just stuck where it is. So this to me looked like a great opportunity to try and explore uh, between very closely related species, uh, what promotes or limits range, exp range expansion to new environments. And my hypothesis uh, was that it is related to differences in their thermal tolerances because the two environments 
have very different temperature regimes. And here you can see the maximum summer temperature and minimum winter temperature in the Eastern Mediterranean and in the Red Sea. And you can see that the Red Sea is much warmer than the Eastern Mediterranean in summer. However, in winter, the Eastern Mediterranean is actually a much more extreme environment uh, with very, very cold temperatures. So to test uh, if the warm or cold or both temperatures might play a role in this selective invasion, I conducted a laboratory experiments with specimens from both species that I've collected in the Gulf of Aqaba and cultured under temperature covering the range of temperature in the Mediterranean, so roughly between 15 and 30 degrees, and also two additional temperatures uh, that are mimicking uh, future warming scenarios at 32 degrees and at 35 degrees. And what I actually measure is their classification rate. Um, now, this measurement actually provides quantification of how much calcium carbonate is produced by each individual, but it is also considered a proxy for the well-being of the host. And what we see here is that while both species had a similar response to very cold and very warm temperature by, by stopping calcification, as you can see in both 15 and 35 degrees for both species, you can see that the successful invader already increases classification rates to optimal value between 15 and 20 degrees, while the non-invasive species reached optimal temperature only at 25 degrees. So this was the first indication that cold winter temperature might be the factor limiting the non-invasive species from establishing a population in the Eastern Mediterranean. But also looking at the warmer side of things, if you look at the 32 treatment, you can see that the non-invasive species is actually doing pretty well at 32 degrees, only reducing calcification at 35, while the invasive species is actually not doing very good. And at 30 degrees after two weeks of experiment has already uh, shut down its calcification. And this is kind of interesting to me because if we try to like imagine what will happen in the Eastern Mediterranean when we slightly start to or continue to increase the temperatures, this means that the very successful invasive species will have to migrate away. It could not tolerate the summer temperature while the, the same increase in temperature, but in winter will remove the barrier for the non-invasive species that could also tolerate the summer temperature. So we can kind of see or imagine how they're going to replace it, each other. So at least in terms of functional diversity, we're not actually losing anything, which maybe can bring us a little bit of comfort uh, when we think about what happens to diversity, but what happened to the function of that diversity. Okay, so at this stage, I was approaching the end of my PhD and I was thinking of what I wanted to focus on next and thinking of these results and other parts of my PhD really emphasized for me that the question that I want to deal with uh, has to do with why are some species more tolerant than others? What confers heat tolerance that would help some species with global warming, but will make other species extinct either locally or uh, generally? So before I left, I did one more experiment uh, uh, as, a, as a short postdoc in Ben Gurion University, trying to understand the role of symbiont algae in the thermal tolerance of the host. And uh, this, is, this is kind of something that we know from corals, that symbionts have an active role in supporting uh, host corals under thermal stress. But in foraminifera, this isn't established at all. So I wanted to try and, and start to look into that. So I did another experiment on Ophisigina lobifera, this time on the Mediterranean population. And this time, instead of just measuring the calcification rate, I also measured the net photosynthesis. So again, I culture in different temperature, and again, we see that in 15 and 35 degrees, calcification is completely inhabited. The optimum is at 25, but is already reduced at 32 degrees. However, for photosynthesis, we see a much broader optimal range. And we see um, that between 15 and 32 degrees, net photosynthesis remains the same and is only decreased at 35 degrees. So if we kind of schematically think about this, like this drawing that I made here, we can see that the symbiont has a broader uh, uh, envelope that it can prospering, which means it can potentially support the host or the holobiont uh, under temperature that are outside of its optimal range. However, this is not proof of anything uh, for many reasons, but one of them is that net photosynthesis actually takes into account respiration from both the algae and the host. So to try and target the, the role or the, the, the influence of it on the symbionts, I've decided to take this one step further and do a transcriptome experiment on the specimens at the end of this experiment. So it was a three-year 
three weeks exposure um, to the temperature that you see here. And out of this, we took specimens from the 15, so cold stress, 32, so warm stress, and 25, which is the optimal conditions. And we analyzed their transcriptome. So basically, we can see which genes regulate differently in the different treatments. So which genes, which functional pathways are involved in dealing with cold stress versus warm stress. And again, I'm not going to go into the details, but just to say that the two main things that came out is it actually dealing with cold stress involved a lot more genes than the warm stress. So it's a matter, it's a matter of quantity of genes involved in the process, but also what they're doing. So not only there were a lot more genes in the cold stress, we also saw that most of these genes uh, had to do with metabolic processes, a lot of it to do with photosynthesis indeed. And in the warm stress, uh, most of the genes related had to do with microtubuli and ciliary processes. So a major difference in the way that um, the, the organism deals with cold versus warm stress. But to zoom back into the question of the role of symbiont, I'm now only focusing on genes related to photosynthesis because obviously the foraminifer is not photosynthesizing and the algae is. So this is like our way to, to zoom in to the question of what are the symbionts doing. And in this heat map, basically what you can see is that a lot of genes are involved in regulating for cold stress. Some overlap and some genes are involved in regulating for warm stress. But because we remember that net photosynthesis doesn't actually change in cold stress, but it does in warm stress, we understand that all this upregulation of genes related to photosynthesis is the actual reallocation of cellular resources to photosynthesis to allow the net production of oxygen. Um, yeah, so this got me really, really enthusiastic, but unfortunately, leaving the postdoc life, this postdoc life, this was my time to leave and start uh, my first fellowship. So I will leave this here uh, um, and hopefully say a few more words at the end when I describe what I'm currently doing. Uh, but just to say that there is a lot of potential in using foraminifera and their symbionts to understand how symbionts supports thermal tolerance of their hosts. Okay, so now I'm going to, uh, again, briefly talk about my Royal Society Fellowship that I did at the University of Bristol. The aim of this fellowship was to try and understand uh, what would happen to carbonate production by benthic foraminifera uh, with temperature, uh, answering mainly to question what would happen to the quantity of carbonate uh, produced and what would happen to the quality of carbonate produced. And we had quite a, uh, what I think is a very cool plan with a lot of field work, uh, going into the geological record and try to understand in previous warming events what happened to these two features of carbonate, the quantity and the quality. However, unfortunately, I started this fellowship in February 2020, which is also why I like to call it my COVID postdoc. Um, and yeah, after about five months of complete closure and the ongoing, you know, no like traveling restrictions and, and, and all of that, it was quite clear that I'm not going to be able to do all that geological field work that I really wanted to do. Uh, and that I have to come up with a different plan. So I still really wanted to answer these questions. I still really want to understand what would happen to quantity and quality of carbonate produced by foraminifera. So what I've decided to do is that I've decided to look at specimens that I had from my PhD. Um, so these are the specimens that I collected from this thermally polluted area and the control station, and all the specimens that I had from laboratory experiments. And it seems that we could still try to ask these questions with similar tools that were available to me uh, at the University of Bristol, even though you couldn't be with technicians in the same room and all of that uh, cluster that uh, I'm sure we've all had to deal with. Um, but yeah, so this is what we've decided to do, use my old specimens, my old shells from my PhD to answer these new questions for this fellowship. Okay, so just a small reminder, these are the three key species that I've worked on during my PhD. These are the most interesting species because they are, they are all tolerant to some increase of temperature, but in different uh, levels. So on the left, we have Pavotalia. This is the most, apparently the most tolerant species of foraminifera. In the middle, we have Lachlanella, which is still tolerant, uh, but maybe not as much. And on the right is Amphistigina, which still lives at the edge of the plume, but not much more than that. And the little emojis is just to, re everyone remembers while I talk, how sensitive uh, they are to increasing temperatures. So the first question uh, was what happens to the quantity of uh, calcium carbonate? And the way that we've 
uh, quantify that is by looking at 3D models of these foraminifera specimens. Basically, what we did is that we CT scanned them. And when you CT scan an object, you get a lot of 2D images that you can then stack together and create a very, very detailed uh, 3D model that then you can uh, start calculating in, in very high accuracy, basically every morphological feature that you want, including how big it is, how thick the shell is. I mean, you, you see how detailed it is, so you can understand like the great potential here. Um, yeah, so what we did is that uh, we again took specimens that we collected throughout the year from the warm station, from the control station. So again, warm station is presented by the red dots and the blue station, uh, the control station by the blue dots. And um, we saw three different kinds of responses in terms of the amount of calcium carbonate produced. So the most tolerant species didn't really change the size of the shells, but did create a thinner shell. So the wall thickness became smaller in the specimens that were produced in the summer. And this quantifies as about 10% uh, decrease per, per individual. The second tolerant species had a dramatic decrease of size of about 60 degrees, which included actual shrinking, actual dwarfism, but also thinning of the shell. And then this, uh, the most sensitive species, or we shouldn't call it sensitive because it can still tolerate some, but in comparison to the other species, uh, the least tolerant species uh, also showed a, a, a dwarfism effect of about 30 degrees. But let us remember the warm station here is only warmer by one degree. So that's quite an intense response to quite a small increase in temperatures. And when we um, calculated the effect of individual uh, for of, of individual size and, and amount of calcium carbonate of foraminifera together with the changes of abundances that we saw from the monitoring earlier on, we've calculated that the decrease of calcium carbonate under the best case scenario would be over 70%. And I remind you, these are the most tolerant foraminifera species. So we're basically looking at quite a catastrophe in terms of how much carbonate is going into the system and how much sand is going into the system. So think about the coastline, it's quite, it's quite horrific. Maybe you shouldn't really think about it. Okay, so the second question that we wanted to ask is about the quality of the carbonate. So a lot of people deal with uh, quantifying the amount of cal calcium carbonate produced under different climate change scenarios. And quality is sometimes being overlooked, which is a bit of a shame because the quality of the carbonate has a really important role. Um, as the, the shell is obviously has a function of protecting the organisms. And if the shell is not as robust, the organism is then subjected to external stressors like boring from other organism and extreme a wave energy. However, there isn't really that much known about what climate change will do to the quality of uh, calcium carbonate shells. So to look into that, we used Raman spectroscopy that provides indication of chemical composition as well as crystal structure of minerals. And this provides an efficient and cost-effective way to identify changes in material properties. So uh, this is just like to demonstrate the principle. You can see the, the Raman spectra of basically any carbonate, but let's just say of like a random foraminifera. Uh, you will have four peaks and they will move or shift uh, along the wave numbers according to their chemical composition and crystal structure. Now it has been shown many times for both bi biological and non-biological carbonates that as magnesium content increases, the a wave number or the position of these Raman peaks will be higher. So basically the black line that you see here has lower content of magnesium and red has higher content of magnesium. And we can, we can measure that in, in quite an elegant and easy way. And this is just another way to show this, that uh, as we said, as temperature increases, more magnesium is incorporated into the lattice. And we, if we measure the Raman spectra, we will see higher wave numbers. So this is moving from the black dot to the red dot. However, there's also another situation that might happen. So what happens if the crystal structure is changing, but not to the magnesium calcium due to some, something that the organism is doing wrong because it's calcifying under stress. So this would give us another data point that is not actually on that predicted linear correlation between magnesium content and wave number in calcium. Okay, so turning back to um, to the specimens collection that I had uh, for my PhD, I went back to the specimens from the uh, thermally disturbed area, and I've chosen four time points uh, 
that according to more laboratory uh, experiments that we did and more observations uh, from my PhD showed us that this kind of covers the thermal condition throughout the year in both locations and also the thermal condition that both species can actually tolerate. And we basically have a warm, uh, like the warm condition. So this is the summer in the warm station. We have normal optimal conditions. So this is spring in the control station. We have cold. So this is cold temperatures in the warm station in the winter, still high enough for the species to calcify, um, but still quite cold. And what I call here too cold. So this is too cold to calcify. This is the winter in the control station. If you remember from my magnesium calcium analysis, we saw how all the specimens were above their uh, ability to calcify. Temperature were too low for them. And when we plot our magnesium calcium to the position of the largest Raman peak, we see that most of them fall exactly where the shoes on this linear correlation between magnesium calcium and Raman position, except for two points. And these two points are the one from the very cold. So cold stress kind of gave us a higher uh, wave number than what we've expected. And the warm, the warm specimens that we collected in the summer have given us a lower wave number than what we have encountered, but this was still a little bit hard to interpret. So what I decided to do is to take specimens that I've cultured in the lab under known conditions, and I've measured their classification rate, so I roughly know the amount of stress that they were under. I also just want to mention that the, all the specimens that I cultured in the lab, uh, well, the ones that I've used after, had calcine staining. So this is a fluorescent stain that shows you exactly when your experiment starts. Um, and this is like the bright part here and everything that was precipitated after that, whoops, after that bright part has definitely been calcified under the assumed conditions. And this was actually a, a kind of a cool exercise because we had the quantity of calcium carbonate produced in each of the uh, treatments because we measure calcification rates. Um, but we also had the, the, the Raman spectra of each of these. So we can see what we saw before. We see an optimum uh, at 25 degrees. We see a decrease at 32 degrees and, uh, and no carbon production at 15 and 35 degrees. This obviously meant that I could not use specimens from 15 and 35 because there was no carbon to measure. So focusing on what we did have, we didn't see that linear trend. And at first it was disturbing, but if you really think about it, this does make sense, or at least it makes sense when you think about it in context of the field specimens, because you see an increase between 25 and 30 degrees, which is what you would expect, but then you see a decrease at 32 degrees. However, however we also know that 32 degrees is a stressful temperature for amphistogynal obifera. So in fact, we see the same thing that we saw in the field. We saw a, a reduction, a, a lower wave number <clears throat> for specimens culture under heat stress. And if you think about this cold temperature, then we actually see a higher wave number from what we expect. So obviously there's still some way to go. And this is stuff that we're still a, a working on to establish how this relationship exactly works and exactly what happens. But I think there are two things that kind of come out of this work that I can already a, kind of mention. And I think the first, the first interesting thing is that Obviously, there are other things that changes the Raman position, um, except for magnesium content. And our, our hypothesis uh, is speculating that as uh, the foraminifera is stressed, it creates more and more defect in the calcite lattice, which then accumulates. And when you measure the Raman spectra, it moves the position um, into, a different, uh, into a different lower or higher position according to the kinds of defect that the foraminifera incorporates into the shell. And we're now trying to collaborate to corroborate this by using atomic force microscopy and other microscopy methods. And should hopefully uh, be something that we can shortly prove. But more broadly and, and more interestingly, to me, this means that there is the potential here to create a proxy for classification under stress that we can then use on specimens collected from the field. And potentially, if if enough, uh, if if it's preserved well enough, we could do it also in the geological record. And this could have really great potential to understand processes of, um, of stress in the geological record. Um, okay, I'm not going to go into the atomic force microscopy right now because it's not really done. Um, and also because, unfortunately, again, still living the postdoc life, I had to move on to my next uh, fellowship. So I moved to Oxford to do a completely different project uh, in which I wanted to try and understand how 
evolutionary processes under future warming will affect a, the carbon cycle, basically. And I've briefly, briefly mentioned it as the beginning, so I'm going to go back to this now um, to understand what I mean, what I mean by that. So um, future warming is a long process that happens over decades. A foraminifera and coccolithophores are organisms that reproduce quite fast. So it means that there's quite a lot of time for them to go through evolutionary processes to affect how well they do different things that they do. And when we think of photosynthesis in the ocean, uh, which is often referred to as the carbon pump, we think of uh, carbon dioxide being turned into organic uh, matter and sinking to the ocean floor, basically creating a sink for carbon dioxide in the ocean. However, if photosynthesis is not as great and there is more respiration, then the opposite is happening. The organic carbon is then being turned in to carbon dioxide, which can then be uh, um, released back to the atmosphere. The other important um, process that's happening with calcifying organisms is, of course, the calcification of their shell. So intuitively, you would think, oh, that's great. They take carbon dioxide, they make shell. The shell then you know, goes to the ocean floor, and then it's, it's, it's set there. We were good. But unfortunately, the chemical process is a little bit different. So you take carbon dioxide, and through a, a few processes, you then create the shell that sinks into the ocean floor, but you also produce some carbon dioxide. So basically, it's not, an, it's not as an efficient pump as photosynthesis. And there was quite a lot of research, both in modeling and in observation, that quantifies what is the ratio of classification and photosynthesis that takes to remain a, below the, the, sinks, the, the sink function of a classifying phytoplankton. And in case anyone is interested, this, this ratio is 0.6. You have to have more photosynthesis than classification by 0.6 to remain in. So, so the system remains as a sink for carbon dioxide in the oceans. And that, that I think is very interesting, but I think it overlooks the evolutionary part of things and the fact that organisms do adapt and definitely organisms that are microalgae that have super fast uh, reproduction, most certainly adapt to certain conditions. And this is kind of what I wanted to look into in, in, in this fellowship. And the, the first order question that I wanted to ask was, can coccolithopher adapt to elevated temperatures? And if they can, how in terms of photosynthesis and calcification? So basically, if one of these processes is going to be preferred by adaptation more than the other, this can actually turn the function of calcifying organisms from being sink of calcium carbonate like they are today, of, of uh, carbon dioxide like they are today, to being sourced to the atmosphere. Um, okay, so to narrow this down a little bit to actually fit to a two-year fellowship work, I've decided to um, focus on coccolithophores. And the reason I did it on a uh, coccolithophores and not plant and not uh, foraminifera is that their life cycle is much faster, so it's much easier to try and track their adaptation processes within two years. Um, and this, the two questions that kind of fall into that were: Do latitudinal partitioning affect thermal tolerance? Uh, and does it affect adaptation potential? So I did focus in on coccolithophores, but I even zoomed in furthermore to a species called Emiliana huxleyi. This is uh, today the most uh, cosmopolitan coccolithophore species, which really gives an advantage when you're trying to understand adaptation to temperature. So here you can see the nine strains that I worked on on a map. The colors represent the uh, average temperature uh, of the sea where they're from. And the idea was kind of simple. I will take strains from the polar, so they're cold adapted. I will take strains from the tropics that are warm adapted, and I will see what they're doing in the lab and how what is their ability to adapt to new temperatures. Okay, so just to, just to establish the, the model, we had uh, three species from the polar region, cold adapted, three species from the Mediterranean, warm adapted, and three species from temperate locations, randomly distributed as intermediates. And basically what I did is that I took each of these nine strains and they were acclimated to 15 degrees. I don't think that's the actual optimal way to acclimate them, but unfortunately this is what culture collections do. So this is what I kind of needed to work with. And I've exposed each of these nine strains to a five temperatures between 15 and 28 degrees. And I measure their growth rate. And here you can see the results. And there are several things that you can see. First, you can see that there is no clear pattern between what would be cold adapted species and warm adapted species, you can definitely see that they all kind of produce something very similar 
with the optimal growth rate at either 23 or 25 degrees? Um, so I guess the straightforward answer is that no, latitudinal origin does not affect the thermal tolerance of, of Ameliana hexlei at least. What was very interesting is that actually the most variation was between the Mediterranean strains. So within the Mediterranean strain, we had the least thermally tolerant species. So this strain over here that doesn't even uh, didn't even survive the treatments of 25 degrees, but we also had the most thermally tolerant species, which is this one, that could actually was the only species that could grow uh, under 28 degrees. So at this point, we we kind of thought, okay, maybe the the use of nine strains, which was quite a lot of effort, didn't really take us anywhere. And I personally thought it was quite surprising that if you're adapted through you know, thousands and thousands of of, uh, uh, of of generations to cold, to very cold or very warm, that, that that should affect your thermal tolerance, right? But apparently it doesn't. Apparently there are stronger things to consider. And if we think about the Mediterranean, this probably correlates to the very strong seasonality that we see in the Eastern and Western Mediterranean. But this is still uh, something to explore. To answer my questions regarding... Um, thermal tolerance and adaptation potential, I've then moved on to do an adaptation experiment. So what I did now is I still took these nine strains, which I now know has an optimum at 23 or 25 degrees and is either not growing or uh, experiencing stress under 28. And I've just cut, and I've just uh, continued to grow them for six months, which equivalates to about 200 generations uh, in these conditions. So 23 and 25 is optimal and 28 um, as stress, here you can see the average growth rate over the six months um, uh, duration. And you can see that uh, indeed all of them have uh, even long kind of long term um, an optimal optimal growth rate at, uh, of about of about one divisions per day uh, in both 23 and 25, and that most of them cannot survive the 28 degrees. And this doesn't have to do with their origin. This is just, most of them just can't do it. Uh, however, we did have three exceptions and I'm going to point out. The first is the temperate strain uh, that you see here. So at the beginning of the experiment, it didn't seem to do anything, but about two months later, it actually, it was actually able to push through and <clears throat> start uh, uh, growing faster, uh, but not as fast as its optimal uh, condition. So it's definitely under stress, but it was able to maintain, but this is some form of acclimation where enough cells were able to survive until they could adapt to uh, the 28 degrees. Then we had our two uh, interesting Mediterranean species, the one that doesn't grow at 25. So it did grow for a little while with very, very slow rates. And then it just, it couldn't take it anymore and it disappeared. And then finally, we had the most resilient, uh, thermally resilient species that actually grew throughout the experiment quite consistently, uh, but not in high rates like the other a, a, like the, the other from that strain that was grown in optimal conditions, of course. Okay, and this and this is where we could start answering questions about whether or not their potential to adapt has increased or did it not change over these six months. So what we did is that after these six months of just ex exposure to constant temperature, I've then taken these specimens and I've now exposed them again to temperature between 17 and 28 degrees. And this is what you see here. So the first panel is what we saw before. They're acclimated to 15 degrees and I exposed them to the range of temperature. And we saw uh, most of them did the same thing with optimum at 23 and 25. And most of them, excluding this strain here uh, uh, on the right, did not grow at 28 degrees. Now we look at the lower panel. This is after six months of acclimation at 25 degrees. And we see something quite optimistic. We see that a lot of these strains can now actually grow at 28 degrees. So if this is not adaptation, I don't know what is. They couldn't grow, now they can. This to me means, hmm, okay, there's something There's something that might happen uh, with warming that will allow this very important organism to continue and survive. And also interestingly, we saw that this happened to all the strains except for the polar strains. So while well, before we could have said that your uh, origin doesn't change your thermal tolerance, it definitely does change your ability to adapt your, your adaptation potential. Um, over here at the lower panel, you can see the two strains that did grow at 28 over the eight month, over the six months experiment. And we see something quite similar to what we see at 25 degrees. 
And I will touch, touch on that in a second. Okay, so now uh, zooming further into my question of, okay, adaptation potential, adaptation of coccolithophores, but what would happen to what they're doing to the carbon cycle? So I wanted to look at what they're doing in terms of photosynthesis and what they're doing in terms of calcification. And at the end of this six months exposure, I did that experiment where I grew them again. And when they were in mid exponential, which is when they're actually doing a, a, the, the best in, term of, in terms of growth, I wanted to see what they're doing in terms of photosynthesis and later in terms of calcification. But here we see photosynthetic rates. Um, and basically what we see is that after six months of acclimation to optimal condition and stress conditions, so optimal would be the green, stress would be the pink, um, and the original 15 degrees acclimation would be the blue. And you can see what happens uh, when you expose them to 25 degrees and then when you expose them to 28 degrees. And basically what we see is that when you, when you acclimate them to higher temperature of 25, all of them uh, are now doing much better. The photosynthetic rate is much faster and they can actually fixate more carbon um, as, they, as they survive. For the 28, uh, it wasn't really the case. It was quite similar to what uh, happened when they were adapted to uh, acclimated to 15 degrees. When we look at the response to 28, we see that it didn't really uh, work as well. They're still doing quite poorly. In some cases, even have a, a very negative net photosynthesis, which means they are now a, a releasing carbon dioxide and not fixing it. So um, basically, I think the main thing that this shows us is the food. If we adapt uh, Emiliana Huxley to warmer temperatures, there is the potential that it could photosynthesize much better and become more of a sink than more of a source to atmospheric carbon dioxide. Looking at the same uh, thing, but uh, this time thinking about calcification, the amount of calcium carbonate that they produce per day, we see something less uh, consistent. So different strains do different things. Sometimes it's doing better, sometimes it's not. Um, but what I do want you to pay attention to is that at least for two of these strains, they're doing so much better. They're doing hundreds of times more calcium carbonate than what they did before. So this sort of adaptation could actually mean that they become more of a source rather than a sink for atmospheric carbon dioxide. But this is more, uh, more ambivalent than the photosynthesis, which is much more straightforward. And this could possibly indicate that adaptation uh, uh, does prefer photosynthesis, but there's still a little bit of work that we're still doing to get to that. And just to like underline the main uh, observation here, thermal acclimation is possible, but its effectiveness is reduced when temperature is too extreme. This means that the rate in which we continue to warm up the Earth will be the key to maintain the functionality of Emilia Huxley, coccolithophores in general, and really honestly, all of the ecosystems. Uh, but this is just a demonstration of how you know, warming will continue. We're not going to just stop with all uh, uh, fossil fuels, but we have to do it in a, in a rational way. And I think one of the main things that we need to be doing now is thinking about these rates, because just continuing talking about the one and a half degrees that we already know is coming in about 20 years, this is not enough. We need to really understand the rates of warming that our ecosystems can and cannot tolerate. Okay, so as I've said, this is still ongoing work and and the two things that we are doing right now is first of all, that we are uh, trying to quantify these changes in photosynthetic and calcification activities and see how these combined will affect the, um, uh, the carbon cycle, the oceanic carbon cycle. The second thing that we did is that we took all of the specimens at the end of the experiment and we took them to transcriptome analysis and proteomics analysis. And we really want to see uh, what are the functional pathways, molecular pathways that are involved in adaptation of this organism, because this could also be a very important key to creating a more resilient ecosystem. Um, yeah, and do I, do I have a few more, if I can just have a few more minutes, I would just like to talk about how, how I see all of this kind of uh, coming together. And a lot of people in this field ask themselves what will happen to marine ecosystem and what will happen to the services that these ecosystem provide. And to me, there are two questions that are really, really important. Um, the first is how do different ecosystems respond and how does their response then affect each other? How do they feedback back to each other? And what I mean is that a lot of the time we think about like what I've just talked about, and we also think about this quite a lot with trees, that when they stop photosynthesizing, 
we no longer have this great sink of carbon dioxide and this is this will be terrible and we'll have a lot of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere but we don't or at least I'm, I'm not aware of a lot of literature that talks about what happens after that and just as an example what we could think about are coral reefs so coral reefs contrib contribute roughly a sixth of global carbon production we know that there are major bleaching events coming in the next years that will probably destroy a lot of this ecosystem, a lot of these calcifiers. Basically, what means is that as all of these corals and, and a co um, shelf ecosystem dies off, there would be a massive alkalinity increase in the open ocean because there will be no calcification going on. And then I think we need to think about, okay, what does this do? to the phytoplankton in the ocean. If, if they can now calcify better or photosynthesize better or worse, and what does this do again to the amount of, of carbon dioxide in the ocean? And now that then affects what is left of the shelf ecosystem. And I think these feedbacks are not understood well enough. And it's a very important thing that we need to understand if we, if we want to have effective conservation efforts uh, moving forward. The second thing that I'm very interested in is how do we make organisms more resilient? And this, of course, you know, is thinking about which genes are involved in adaptation and what kind of, you know, cool CRISPRs and 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 uh, gene manipulation we can do. But this can also be much simpler than that. And and I this is quite a preliminary thing, and also I don't have enough time to go into it. But I'm just going to say that now that I'm in a lab that actually cultures a, a algae that gave me a really great opportunity to actually isolate the symbionts from the foraminifera, culture them independently and experiment on them independently, which brought me to uh, something that I'm very excited uh, that I'm doing right now, which is that this, okay, so what you see here are symbionts isolated from different foraminifera. The collection is actually much larger, but this is just uh, to demonstrate the, the amount of diversity of symbionts that foraminifera has. Um, and I've characterized the thermal tolerance of each of these uh, symbiont strains. And then I've bleached, I've thermally bleached Amphysigena lobifera, so the super common foraminifera that exists everywhere, but is not going to tolerate a lot of warming. I've bleached it in the lab, it kind of looked like this. And then I've reintroduced some of the more tolerant uh, symbionts into the culturing water. And after waiting quite patiently for a few weeks, uh, we do see signs that they pick up the new uh, symbionts and that this allows them to become more active and calcify more. And I'm now uh, in the process of um, uh, uh, sequencing which symbiont algae has a, or contribute to this recovery of them and what genes are involved in that. So this is this is kind of, of a way to think about more natural ways to think about what would happen to symbiont bearing calcifiers and how they can become more resilient. And of course, these two questions kind of feedback uh, into each other, because if we think about how ecosystems are going to affect each other, then we need to think about which organisms we need to put our efforts into when we think about conservation, when we think about genetic adaptations. That's that's roughly roughly it. I just want to uh, uh, thank you all for listening and mention again that this was only like the highlights and I'm very open to any discussions and any questions. And I want to thank my funders and my former and current supervisors and collaborator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana, for uh, this excellent talk. It was extremely important for our students uh, to get um, uh, more knowledge about um, um, forums and cocolid first. So I, I opened the, um, the, the room for questions from the audience. As always, I don't see everybody, so just jump in or write the hand and then uh, go ahead and ask the question. Don't be shy. Hi, Donna. Uh, very <laughs> hi, this is Beverly. Oh, hey. Um it's very exciting to hear hear all your progress and all your work over the past couple of years. Um I I have a I have a question that might uh, is probably quite quite basic, but it you know, since I'm I uh, haven't worked with a lot of living for I'm mostly working just with the skeletal remains. When um, I find it interesting when you were talking about the thickness of the shell. Okay, so with the thermal, you know, the differences in the in the thermal change. Um, do you, you know, with coral, 
you know, obviously this is a nice, you know, there's a clear parallel here between, you know, it's a known parallel between uh, studies on coral and studies on foraminifera, you know, very similar issues with the symbionts and, and uh, calcification. Um, when the forams are skeletonless, okay, as you're, you know, this, this this thinning of the skeleton is this is this also linked to the lack of production of a skeleton creating a thinner skeleton or is it actually moving away from the production of its skeleton because the skeleton obviously or maybe not so obviously is essentially you know that that's uh, being produced by the organism how well can a can the foraminifera is, is it known how well foraminifera can survive basically do they have an equivalent um naked form that can reproduce in the same way that coral can reproduce are you following what i'm asking yeah i i think i think i'm following what you're asking but i'm afraid i don't i don't have a, a very solid uh -huh. answer i think in enlarged the, the the answer is that we don't know what we do know is that a part of what foraminifera does when they're stressed is that they reduce a, or stop calcifying, depending on the amount of stress. However, they, what they are, when they reproduce, they already reproduce with shells. So while there are species of naked foraminifera, I think that calcifying foraminifera, as far as I'm aware, are not, not able to live without shells at all. They're just able to have smaller shells, thinner shells, but not, not completely without them. Interesting. Maybe they can. <laughs> um, the is there if, if well, I'll see who else has some questions. Um, um, hi, Lana. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to ask something about the uh, the Raman spectrum. Uh, as far as I know, that that the Raman analysis technique is like a surface technique. It's only can, can detect like the, the depths of like 10 nanometers. And the the general thickness of the, the forums is about like micro scale. And have you ever detect the like the, the, the outer surface and the the inner surface of the forum and compare the different like the what are you uh, talking about the crystallinity and the Mechanism ratio between the like. Yeah. So what we do is that we measure it in two, in two ways, in two strategies. We we take full shell. We take like whole shells, and we just point the laser at it, and we do its surface, and then we polish these specimens. So we have the inside of the shells, and we remeasure them, and we see exactly the same. Ah, uh, okay. We're confident that it it doesn't change with the profile depth, in the calcite. So it's pretty homogeneity. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. More questions? Okay, we have a question. We, can, we have a question in the chat from Marta. Um, well, first she thanks, she thanks you for the talk. And she's wondering if the thickness of the shells in the geological record will be a proxy for temperature. Sorry again, if the thickness of the shells is a proxy we'll be a, can be used as a proxy for <clears throat> temperature variability. Well, I don't think it could actually be a temperature proxy because I think there might be other stressors that could affect this specific parameter. Um it's it's kind of it's it's a general stress thing that as stress increases, calcification decreases. So I don't think we would be able to take something from the geological record and say, oh, this is you know 20% thinner. So temperature is increased by X. It's not it's not quite that simple, but we do have shell chemistry that we can use for that. Um, so we can know if the thinning of the shell is a result of temperature or not. If that if that answers the question. Okay. I think it answers. It does. I have I have another question if there aren't any students raising hands. Please go ahead. Okay. okay, Donna, can you can you go back in the presentation to um, uh, the graphs with temperature, um, the earlier ones with the forums near the power station? 
Yep, just give me a second. Mm -hmm. Oh, I need to share a screen, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, I don't see the share screen button. It's disappeared. Your share screen, you're, you are sharing. I am, okay. Well, it, but it, you need to drag your the PowerPoint presentation into the okay. other screen, it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, it's technology again. Uh, where are you, screen? Uh, he was peeking in from the yeah. corner. Yeah, 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 I don't know how to move it. Uh, okay. I'm just going to not do it in full screen and there you go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this one. Okay. Well, right. Um, so I have a question. I, 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 it's, it's really interesting to me because the, um, you know, the water is incredibly warm there. <laughs> um, we, we joke around when we're diving that, you know, sometimes you can warm up your suit in the winter time when you're cold. You can do some self warming of the suit and you can use the same thing to cool off when you're diving there in the summertime because it's so hot. But the, the thing that's the thing that's so um, the thing that's kind of fascinating to me is the the temperature range, you would think that the temperature coming off of the power station. What is the measure? Okay, I guess the question is, what is the the, the actual um, uh, outflow temperature through the year? Like, because according to this, I would think you, as the temperature, the general, the, as the surrounding temperature is higher, you would, I would think that you would have a smaller um, range between the lower and higher temperatures. And then the winter time when the water is colder is the temperature coming out. It looks like it's actually colder, like the cooling process, like the, the, the there isn't, it, is it, is it the case that the actual outflow is also changing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, okay. This is this is really an electrical company question and not a science question, um, because they so there are like five different units that pour out water and this depends on like the, the amount of electricity being produced by the station. So in different mm -hmm. parts of the year, there's different amount of outputs uh, of water, which then affects uh, differently. Um, yeah, I was also quite quite surprised that the difference is is. It's relatively consistent, which is great. yeah. I mean, I guess it makes sense. I mean, I guess I, I imagine that the cooling that it creates maybe that stays relatively consistent, so that the temperature differential. I don't know. That surprised me. I would I would have thought that it would sort of um, you know that it wouldn't have the same range <laughs> in different seasons. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's quite it's quite consistent. I think it's the the interaction between the amount. Of water that they release back, the warm water that they release, and the actual cooling that the the water are doing is kind of somehow. I don't, I don't know well, if it's yeah. one purpose, but it's yeah. Because I I think that could be actually an interesting added variable, you know, in in terms of this whole kind of environmental impact. Because if, I mean, my understanding is that you know, the summertime is when you have this, you know especially high electricity usage. Um, Okay. Anyway, that's, I just thought that was okay. So I yeah, am seeing what I'm really seeing. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. You you talked about atomic microscopy. Yeah. Atomic. What kind of uh, measurements do you do? What kind of information you can get from using this kind of method? Okay. So so two main things, and the the more obvious but unfortunately less useful one is that we see changes in surface area. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that gives you some indication regarding the structure of the, of the surface of the forearm. Um, however, the reason that I'm trying to use it is that I'm trying to get um, an actual quantification of the material property. And specifically, what we're measuring is a probe that tests for elasticity of the material. Mm -hmm. And I didn't show it because I only have it in a very, very raw format. But basically, what we see is that um, Permanifera cultured under stress in the lab reduces elasticity by about 50% mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. so you become a more brittle, I guess. Sorry. Yeah, with larger organisms, a lot of the time it's easier to test because you can just like punch them until they break. But because forms are so small, it's harder to to quantify. So we had to, to go to that yeah, mm -hmm. instrument. If if there okay. is no, I, I, can I ask another question? So maybe a more general one. But you were talking about acclimation and also about evolution evolution change. What's the difference between the, the two? Okay, so that's that's I mean to be fair, almost a philosophical question. Yeah, but, that's uh, why it's interesting. Because <laughs> because in our research group we have a, a beautiful diversity of researchers going from biology to chemistry to physics. We try to respect everyone and we try to not use adaptation unless we actually have evidence of genes, like selection of genes, okay. uh, which is why I still try to not talk about adaptation, even though all of my preliminary sequencing results show that there is adaptation. So it might have slipped away here and there. But uh, yeah, that's the, the general difference is whether there are gene selection or there was not gene selection. Okay. No, that that's interesting. Yeah. But this, I, I think it might be a very local terminology thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It was really interesting. Okay, we have uh, Maya Bloch. Uh, she's saying in the chat, she thanks you very, she thanks you, Dana, for the important work and for presenting so clearly and uh, listening to your academic path for those that are at the beginning. So she thank you. She's thanking you. Uh, more, more questions, maybe? Well, if we don't have more questions, so I thank you very much. You should go out of the share screen option. Um, ah, I can do that for you. Yeah, thank you. so we can see you. And, um, and, uh, and to thank you uh, that you came virtually and I, we will hope that uh, we'll be also visiting us in Haifa. Hopefully, hopefully. All right. Thank you for having me. Thank no you, problem. Uh, have a great uh, continuation of the day in, uh, in the you UK. You too. All right. Thank you. See you guys. Bye-bye.